I'm Neil Sorrell and I'm uh, a lecturer at the University of York uh, Music Department. How did you get involved with Gamelan in the first place? Um, I first heard Gamelan on recordings and read about them when I was an undergraduate in this country. And I went to America as a postgraduate student in 1969, to be precise, to do Indian music. I'd been studying Indian music at SOAS, so I wanted to go over and start a PhD. And I went to Wesleyan University, which has a, a gamelan. And of course, when I arrived there, this was my chance to join one and just play. So I used to go along and just play in their sessions twice a week. Uh, and that was it, really. And then you came back to London? I, I came, well, it, I went actually to India f from America. I, first, actually, I went to Indonesia because I had a chance to go there and find out a little bit more about gamelan and Javanese culture and visit Bali and everything like that. So I took that chance, but I was supposed to be in India for that year, so I had to go straight to India. And, um, and then when I came back from there, uh, I just more or less wasted a year back in England finding my bearings and then got this job in York and that's when I started agitating for a gamelan because I'd had the experience of being in one as a student and said these are very good things to have in a music department. When was that? That was, well, 1973 was when I came here and I started talking about getting a gamelan. And some of the professors here had actually heard of gamelans and knew a little bit about what they could do. So they were sympathetic, but that's as far as it was. They, they wouldn't actually give me any money. Uh, so um, you got a job here as a music teacher? As a, yeah, as a lecturer in, well, they just called lecturer in music. But then they say, well, what sort of specialities can you bring? So there was, they expected some ethnomusicology. And I'd done Indian music, doing my PhD in Indian music, so I was offering to teach that. I had to teach a bit of Western music as well, you know, just anything. And, and they allowed me to teach a course on Java and Bali as well, because I proposed that. I said I'd like to teach that because we got, I can get help from the Indonesian embassy with illustrations, and there are some recordings, but no instruments, of course. <laughs> And then when did the instruments arrive? Uh, well, they arrived here in 1982, so nine years... 1992. 82, 82, 82. 82. so it was, it was nearly nine years after I'd arrived. Although, I'd, of course, they'd been made a year before in Java, so 81 was when it happened. What about the uh, group Gamelan in London? Was there one before? No, no, no. Um, I'm pretty sure there was nothing uh, happening at all. Various things had happened. Um, Dartington College in Devon had a big reputation for, for Indian music. It was very big in Indian music. And the thing about that place was that they were actually having artists there to teach the music practically rather than just someone giving lectures about it. So they had very good Indian musicians in residence there. And one, one of their staff, um, particularly Jack Dobbs, who was on the staff there, was very keen on, I think, particularly Balinese music, actually. And they wanted to get that sort of program going at Dartington. And in 19, I think 1974, they organised a kind of exhibition and residency or something where they got um, a gamelan from, I think, Belgium and they brought it over and they got some Wayang puppets as well and did all sorts of things. I didn't actually go to it, but the guy who was uh, in charge of that was a New Zealander called Alan Thomas. So I just heard this story about a gamelan had come to the UK. <coughs> it was in Dartington. And I was <coughs> very excited. So I said, well, where did it come from? They said, oh, Belgium. So I said, well, what's going to happen to it after, after the event? And they said, well, it goes back to Belgium. So I said, well, that's a big mistake. You, you get a gamelan here, you don't give it back. You have to keep it <laughs> in the UK. Uh, so 
that just happened and then it fizzled out. So and, and so just around 1974, there was that little bit of excitement when something actually happened and students were presumably learning to play a bit. Uh, but I think, again, they were relying on teachers from Holland or something like that. I, I don't know. And eventually, actually, they did buy a Balinese um, Gong Kabyar set in about 1980, 81. It was... A, or 79 even, it was slightly before the thing happened here. So I'm always careful to say that this is like the first Javanese gamelan, because if you say gamelan, people say, oh, the Balinese gamelan had come to Dartington a little bit before that. And Jack Dobbs, I think, had organized that. And it's still there. I mean, it's been carrying on for all that time ever since. But but Balinese, not, not Javanese. But that was the first gamelan. I mean that was Raffles. probably yeah, was oh, Raffles. Gamelan. Yeah, yeah, I think. Uh, the, I mean, being used. I think probably. Uh, yeah, because the chronology was that, of course, the Raffles Gamelan and the, the, the British Museum set and everything. Of course, I, I went straight to the British Museum and I said, Is there any chance we can do something with this Gamelan? And they didn't know what to say. They said, Oh, we don't know anything about it. Can you have a look at it? And. and I had a look at it, and it was all mixed up. Everything was, ah, I said, well, you can't play this. But also, it's an antique. I think you shouldn't be trying to play it. So nothing, nothing happened with that. It was not practical. Um, and then, of course, the, um, I don't know if you know about the, the Durham Oriental Music Festivals. I always mention this as a, a key moment in, in the evolution of, of the gamelan in, in this country. Because in 19, they, they were three, three of them, um, Durham Oriental Music Festivals. I don't know if anyone still talks about them in Durham. I think there's no really survivors left now who will remember them. But um, So they, they had three of them every, every three years. The first one was in 76, and the second one was in 79, and the third one was in 82. And then in 82, they decided not to have another one because they thought things had developed so much in that period. They said, oh, there's so much going on in the country now, we don't need another one, uh, which was quite a good positive way of, of looking at it. So they, they stopped organising these. But the, the first one, um, and Eric Taylor was the professor of music, and unusually for an English professor of music, uh, who is usually just interested in, you know, Western classical and stuff, which is his main thing. But he also had a passion for gamelan, and he uh, wanted to promote it at the first festival. And <laughs> it was a slightly very interesting situation where they had all kinds of wonderful music from all over the, the world, or well, Asia, um, you know, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, I, I can't remember, Thai music, I mean, all sorts of different things. <clears throat> and mostly with artists actually there and live concerts and dance and everything. When it came to Indonesia, uh, they put on, they got Ernst Heinz, the expert in Holland, to come over from Amsterdam and give a lecture about gamelan. And that was it. They didn't have they had no incident. So he was very good because he kept sort of um, mentioning that it's, it's nice if you can actually see these things live and have a gamelan to try them out on. And, and Eric Taylor was obviously very keen to make this point because it looked very odd that one of the major traditions of, of Asia was um, that everyone was enthusiastic about was the one that they could only have a lecture on and not have any live concert or anything. And I think Eric must have had this idea of making sure that the Indonesian ambassador was invited to this lecture. And I just remember, I hope I, you know, my memory is correct, because it was always this thing afterwards about everyone saying, well, what a shame that Ernst has given this lecture, but he couldn't do any demonstrations, we couldn't have any concerts, because we have no gamelan. And the ambassador, and I think his exact words were, I am going to get a gamelan to my embassy. And of course, I just just wrote, just put it in my head and thought, "Wow, that's that's the big news because the gamelan." And I thought, "Well, we'll wait and see if it happens. It may never happen." 
but it arrived the following year, 1977. And um, I had a course, my second time attempt at doing a course without a gamelan. <laughs> and I said at the end of it, I rang the embassy and there was a wonderful uh, information attaché at that time called Kapto Sunoto, who was from Jogja, I think. And he was very refined Javanese, very interested in all the arts, knew a lot about gamelan. And I rang him, I said, could we, could we bring some students down one Saturday when the embassy is not busy and maybe play the gamelan that's just arrived? And he said, oh, absolutely, because uh, no one was playing it. They've got a gamelan in the embassy, but there's no one playing it because I think most of the embassy staff were probably thinking, oh, gamelan, you know, that's not, not, we don't do that. Uh, <laughs> so we went down and had an afternoon playing gamelan and it was, it was just wonderful. And they looked after us awfully well, you know. So I thought, wow, this is, this is it. This is absolute magic that we've actually had a group of students playing a gamelan in England, uh, December 1977. Of course, so that was the first group well, playing gamelan? Apart from perhaps what had happened in Dartington. Apart so that's the, the yeah, that festival in 74. Group. As far as I know, um, because what might have happened in the 19th century, you know, it's very hard to, I don't know enough about to be sure of it, but I'm 99% sure that. But the reason that the English Gamelan Orchestra made a, a big thing about, about the other thing was that they kept saying the first British group to be playing a Javanese Gamelan regularly, because that one was just a one-off, we just went for that weekend. And, um, but it was because of that that the, the word somehow got around. And I, you know, I mentioned Jan Steele, who had been an undergraduate in York, he, he, so I knew him quite well. And he had got into ethnomusicology and had gone off to study with John Blacking and done all sorts of wonderful things. And he ended up back in Birmingham and he was running an evening class, adult education class on world music. And he rang me up and said, well, at the end of this, could we have um, a session with this class on the Gamelan in London? We'll all come to, Gam to London and you come from York and we'll meet and we'll go to the embassy, get their permission. So we set up this afternoon again with his group in, back in the embassy. And I thought, well, it's just like the other one. We just play some very simple pieces and they have a taster of the gamelan and everything and go away thinking that was nice. And, but Jan being Jan, he, he got in touch. He said, oh, that was really good, really interesting. I think we should try and make it a regular occasion. And I thought, well, what does he mean by that? I can't keep going every week to teach his group. <laughs> and he said, no, what, we should get a group together of people who really want to play gamelan more seriously and are prepared to work at it, you know, and all the rest of it. And he said, I know, I know some people, I've got some friends who I know would love to do it. And, and I said, well, I know a few people, I'm sure, because I said, look, Alec Roth for a start, who was passionate about gamelan, but like me, was just sort of thinking, well, when do we ever get a chance to play one? And he was not, he was a graduate at Durham, but, um, but you know. So I said, I'll invite Alec to be in this, and David Posnett, who's now in Dubai or somewhere, but he was also very keen on gamelan. So we invited a few friends and formed this group of about 10, 12 people or so, not too many. And... Indeed. Well, it was yeah. not that hard to find, and very interesting mixture of personalities. There was some, you know, sort of just sort of professional musicians, like a, somebody who, concert pianist, another one who was flute player, and uh, uh, composers, some very interesting and quite well-known composers, and improvising musicians, all sorts of unusual characters coming together with this shared interest. Uh, and that's, that started in 1980.